Okay, the next movement is the windmill. And with the windmill, we're going to press the bell overhead. We're going to turn our feet at a 45 degree angle away from the bell. And we'll just check your feet. If it's your shoulder and hip width apart, the way we teach it, you have to keep both legs locked. This really promotes flexibility in the hamstrings and the hips. We're going to rotate it just like the overhead squat. We're going to the lock arm, our arm on the bell, and we're going to descend and come back up. A problem that we run into a lot of times is people get so caught up with trying to reach the ground that they actually, instead of keeping about 70% of the weight on the back leg, they want to lean forward. So we can solve that problem by putting the arm behind the back and look at the range. The windmill is a tremendous uh, exercise for shoulder stability, uh, core stability, uh, hip and hamstring flexibility. It's absolutely outstanding. It's an exercise that gives you a lot of bang for the buck. In teaching the windmill, I use the same philosophy I use with a lot of um, my teaching in that we will demonstrate it and talk about it and then we'll go through it with no weight and then we will progress from there. With the windmill, the first thing we want to do is to raise a hand in the air. We want to position our feet so that they're hip to shoulder width apart, comfortable stance. And we want to pick up our toes and turn our toes and point them at a 45 degree angle away from the hand that's in the air. From there we want to kick the hip back, keeping the back leg locked at all times. We also want to keep a focus on the hand in the air and we want to rotate. And I have a client, when we learn this at the beginning, reach for the back knee as they kick the hip back. We also emphasize the fact that we don't want to bend at the waist as much as we want them to focus on kicking the hip back and to gain their depth by kicking the hip backwards. So we feel for the knee, stand up, lock the hips in. Now we want to encourage the student to reach a little bit lower on that back leg. And then a little lower yet, if possible, and continue to test their range of flexibility with good technique. Why do we have them reach for the back leg? When we have them reach for the back leg, it forces them to push their hips back, which is very, very important in the windmill exercise. From there, once they become proficient with technique, with no weight, now we can progress to using weight with the windmill. The next progression in the windmill is to do a reverse windmill or a low windmill. We're going to use the same technique by placing a hand in the air, straddling the bell with the feet hip to shoulder width apart, now turning the toes at a 45 degree angle away from the hand that's in the air. Now we're going to sniff in to pressurize rotate the body and look at the hand in the air as we keep the hip backward and feel for the kettlebell. Make sure the abs are tight and we're going to stand up by pulling with our glute and our hamstring. From there we will descend using the same good technique kicking the hip back, down and up and when we complete the set We'll set the kettlebell down and safely stand up. Once the student has successfully completed the low windmill with good technique, we now will have them place the bell overhead. You can do this with a snatch or with a clean and press. Now we've increased the difficulty of the windmill. Now the student or the client is forced to focus on the weight that is now above their head. So we're going to use the same technique by turning the toes away from the hand in the air. Now it's of vital importance that we keep the elbow locked and that we keep our eyes on the bell. 
It's also very important now that we take the windmill just a little bit at a time. We're going to kick the hips back and not go very far at all. This will help the client gain confidence and it will keep them from going too far, too soon, losing control of the bell and causing a potential injury. Now we're going to have them reach a little bit further. So now we're back to the same technique we used with no weight at the beginning. And a little further yet. And also encourage the client to not go any farther than what they're comfortable with. Some people will be able to go all the way to the ground fairly quickly. Other people you'll find will have flexibility issues. And that's okay too. There's plenty of good that you can get from the windmill by just being able to go part way. This um, weight that we add, whether it's a low weight or if it's high weight up top, um, will help them gain flexibility as they practice this movement. A couple problems that we run into with the windmill is that sometimes people and those people who have taken yoga especially want to take a stance that's real similar to the triangle um, stretch or the triangle posture in yoga. And that's not correct form with the windmill. You always need to double check your feet and make sure that your toes are both pointed at a 45 degree angle. Now from this angle, if I were to turn my toes, now you notice my toes are in line and as I kick my hip back, my hips are actually going straight back. From here, it looks as though they're kicking to the side, but actually they're kicking back in line with the toes or in line with the heels. Okay? Another problem we run into is rotation um, for older men especially. They start to lose that rotation um, through their back and spine. And so that takes a while for them to develop that along with the hip flexibility. There's a lot of people that will be stuck here for a while and we'll encourage them to do low windmills to help gain that flexibility um, as they go. Some people struggle to lock the bell out overhead. Okay, and, and we really got to work on that from the standpoint of if they bend the arm or they don't focus on the bell, the bell will start to waver. So we've got to keep a lockout overhead and sometimes just forcing them into a lockout position and having them crush grip that handle and hold it there um, for time sets will help. Those people who have shortened bicep tendons, there's some other stretches and joint mobility movements that can help them along the way. This is a tremendous movement. Um, it, it's one that you should have in your training protocol, whether you use it as a warm-up exercise with very, very lightweight, or you want to add it in um, in combination with other exercises, um, or, or movements, it's, it's tremendous for core strength and uh, once again hip and hamstring flexibility and shoulder mobility and stability. If we want to load the exercise up and create more of a load, we can clean and press or snatch a kettlebell overhead, straddle another kettlebell and perform a double windmill. Get a feel for the handle and stand up. Once again, focus on standing up by tightening the glutes and pulling yourself up. Windmill, tremendous exercise. You need to add it into your training protocol. For those people who are struggling to kick their hips back, uh, for those kinesthetic learners, um, we can move them over to a wall, have them place a heel close to the wall or against the wall, put the hand overhead, and have them kick their hips back as they rotate until they touch the wall. That gives them the feel of what it's like to kick the hips back and actually allows them to feel that now they are back. So 
So that's a coaching point that works with a lot of people. Um, you might try that.